Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. I'm Arlen Salty, your host and the co-founder of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that is why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After over four decades of holding events throughout the world, we are pulling together some of the best of the best messages from these events. We are here to inspire your day. Okay, let's get started with our next guest. Our speaker today is Kay Arthur. Let me tell you just a little bit about Kay. Kay is a five-time gold medallion award-winning author. Kay founded Precept Ministries International along with her husband Jack in 1972 with a vision to establish people in God's Word. God is using Kay in a ministry to more than 120 countries and is author of more than 100 books and Bible studies translated into over 65 languages. As host of Precepts for Life, a daily radio and television program, Kay is actively teaching an audience of over 300 million people. In this message today, Kay challenges us to dig into the Word of God, to make it the foundation for our life. Kay also shares a brief testimony in how God truly used the Word of God to transform her own life. Now, here is Kay Arthur. Hugh McHale was licensed to preach in Scotland. At the age of 20, he preached his first sermon. At the age of 21, Hugh McHale preached his last sermon. The last message that Hugh got to preach, in it he said, the people of God, he's talking about Scotland, he's bringing the message of the Reformation because of the corruption of the church and the corruption of the nation. And he says, the people of God have been persecuted sometimes by an Ahab on the throne, sometimes by a Haman in the states, and sometimes by a Judas in the church. It was the last message he ever preached because he was arrested. He was taken on in November uh, the 28th in 1666. This 21-year-old boy was put on trial. He refused to recant. He had upheld the word of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. It was the word of God, and he refused to recant. They brought a chair, and they put him in the chair. They took this iron boot, and they put it around his leg. They took a huge sledgehammer, and his knee protruding from this iron boot, they took that huge sled, sledgehammer and said, recant, and he would not. And a blow came down. He had 11 opportunities to recant until that uh, wedge, that iron wedge, went down into his leg. As they watched him, they could see the blood oozing out of the bottom of the boot, covering uh, uh, the floor. And he still would not recant. This was the church that was doing this to a man that was holding forth the word of life in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. A man who would not compromise with truth. A man who would not step into the culture and allow the culture to shape him into a a, uh, man who would deny the word of God. They put him in prison and One of the prisoners asked him, Hugh, how is your leg doing? And he says, I'm not worried about my leg. It's my neck that I'm concerned about. And they came and they took Hugh out. They put a platform out in the public. They had a hangsman's noose on it. He still would not recant. This leg has been totally mutilated, and as he climbs that ladder, this is what he says. I care no more to go up this ladder than if I were going home to my father's house. Each step is a degree closer to him. They put the noose around his neck. 
He took out his pocket Bible and he read from the last chapter of Revelation. One of the verses in the last chapter of Revelation is, Behold, I am coming quickly. He is coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give to every man according to his deeds. He spoke of Christ. And then his feet danced in the air as his soul ascended to heaven. Precious ones, God tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that in the last days difficult times will come because men will be lovers of their own selves. And he goes on and he describes how they love their own selves. And then he talks about how silly women who are laden down with their sins, who are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth, are led astray by these men. As we open the Word of God, if you will go to Deuteronomy chapter 8, I want to show you what God teaches His people right from the beginning. I want to show you the importance of the Word of God. How did Hugh McHale endure that torture how did Hugh McHale go up that ladder knowing that he was going to his death without recanting why didn't he save his neck why didn't he save his life he didn't save it because the word of God was his life so he didn't simply profess it but he lived by it In Deuteronomy chapter 8, just before the children of Israel are getting ready to cross the Jordan and to go into the promised land, finally, after wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, after waiting for all of those who did not believe God, who said, no, there are giants in the land, those people that feared the giants more than they feared God who trusted what they saw more than what God said. Those people died in those 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Now they're getting ready to go in. And Moses is giving them their final exhortation. And this is what he says. All the commandments, and he's speaking for God, all the commandments that I'm commanding you today, you shall be, and this word is key, careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers. You shall remember all the way that the Lord your God has led you in this wilderness these 40 years, that he might, now listen, humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Precious ones, we are coming in for a testing like we have never seen in Canada and in the United States. And it's so that God might show the world the priority of God in our lives, his supremacy. And this is what he goes on to say. He humbled you and he let you be hungry and he fed you with manna which you did not know nor your fathers did not know that he might make you understand that man, listen carefully precious ones, that man does not live by bread alone but by everything, everything, everything that comes out of the mouth of God. How many books are in the Bible? You tell me. It's 66 books. I want to ask you a question. How many of those 66 books do you think God wants us to know? All 66 if we are to live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So what place does the word of God have in your life? What priority does it have in your life? As I've been challenging in all these seminars, are you reading the books of men that are finite, that are human, that have limited education, limited experience? Are you preferring those to the word of God? Oh, precious ones, listen to what he says. We live by everything that comes out of the mouth of God and everything that comes out of the mouth of God that pertains to life and godliness is in this book. This is not a man's book. This is God's book. It is spirit and it is life. When you go to Deuteronomy 
chapter 32 to the end of Moses' life. And Moses is not going to get to go into the promised land because Moses did not treat God as holy. Because Moses lost the priority of God in his, in his life when he struck the rock twice and God says, you're not going in. You didn't sanctify me. He is a holy God. And precious ones, God does not come down to adjust himself to us. Rather, God teaches us the word of God so that we might adjust his, uh, our lives more and more and more and our character more and more into the word of God. In Deuteronomy, this is what Moses says in verse 45, when he had finished speaking all these words to Israel, he said to them, take to your heart all the words with which I am warning you today, which you shall command your sons to observe carefully. Does the word of God have priority in your families? Are you teaching your children the word of God? Are you studying it? Do they see the father, not just the mother, but do they see the father being the instructor of the word of God? He says, even all the words of this law. And this is the verse, for it is not an idle word for you. Indeed, it is your life. Is this book your life? Is this the bread by which you live as they gathered man a day after day? Not because it was required to get brownie points with God, but because they needed it in order to live. Do you gather the word of God in your life day in, day out, because you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. He says, this is not an idle word. It is your life. If the word of God is not your life, what is? What is keeping you from the word? I believe that Hugh McHale was able to stand because of a prayer that Jesus prayed. And I believe, though, that Hugh McHale had to cooperate with Jesus. And I want us to look at that prayer. That prayer is in John chapter 17. Now, when you get to John chapter 17, in verse 5, and this is after they've, they've, they've left the upper room, They've had what we call the Lord's Supper. He's inaugurated the new covenant. He has taught them in John chapter 15 about abiding in him. He has told them in John chapter 15 in just eight, ver I believe it's in, in uh, eight verses, he mentions the word, uh, the word, the world 28 times in just eight verses. And he's telling them, now you have heard the importance of abiding in me, and I want you to know I'm going away, and you're staying, and the world is going to hate you because the world hated me. I want to ask you a question. Are you prepared to be hated by the world? Are you prepared to stand as, a, as a, a child of God, an ambassador of Jesus Christ, holding forth the word of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation? Are you willing to lay down your life for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, this is what he's telling him in John chapter uh, 15. And then in John chapter 16, they're walking and they're on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane where he will be arrested. Jesus knows what is facing him. And at the end of John chapter 16, this is what he says. These things I have spoken to you. These things I have spoken to you so that, now watch, in me. In me, everything that you and I need is in Christ. You may have peace. A child 
was born. A son was given. His name, one of his names is called Prince of Peace. And this is where you have peace. And I want you to know that if you know the word of God, no matter what you've been, no matter where you uh, or what you are enduring, and I've been there, done that. Didn't come to know Christ until I was 29. By then I was married and I was divorced and it was not in my agenda. And the divorce was my own doing by two ministers that counseled with me and told me to leave my husband and never open the word of God to me. I had a religion but not a relationship. I stepped out into the world and I shook my fist in the face of God and I was angry and I said to hell with you God. I'll see you around town. I'm going to find someone to love me. All I wanted was to be loved. All I wanted was someone that would look at me and say, whether you're pretty or ugly, sick or well, in a good mood or in a bad mood, I love you unconditionally. And I went from man to man to man. I sunk into a pit that I dug with my own hands. My husband would call me and tell me he was going to kill himself. And I'd say to him, do a good job so I get your money. I had an affair with a married man, found out that his wife had six children, five children, I'm sorry, and was pregnant with her six. I went deeper and deeper and deeper into a lifestyle because I wanted to be loved. Did I own a Bible? Yes. Did I open it? No. Because it was ho-hum boring to me. And on July 16th, 1963, I had divorced my husband. I fell on my knees and I said, God, you can do anything you want with me. If you paralyze me from the neck down, if I don't care what you do to my two boys, I don't care if I never see another man as long as I live, if you'll just give me peace. And he gave me the Prince of Peace. And because of that peace, I can have peace about my past because I know that he has forgiven me all my sins. When I said to hell with you, God, I found out by reading Ephesians chapter 1 that God said before the foundation of the world to have him with you, Kay. Blessed. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, just as He, God, chose us where? In Christ, in Christ, in me. You have peace. And that's where my peace is. And no matter about the sudden death of my daughter in love, no matter about the, the uh, stroke that has disabilitated uh, my second son, or no matter the fact that my husband has Alzheimer's, no matter the fact that my husband committed, first husband committed suicide, when I told God I'd go back to him and then he hung himself, whatever it is in me, in me, in Christ, you and I have peace. And he says this, he says, be of good, uh, these things I have spoken to you, that you in me, you may have peace. In the world, you have tribulation. Do you understand that? We are in a world of tribulation. We are in a world of testing, but you and I are able to handle it because we know the word of God. And knowing the word of God enables you to know the God of the word. And the God of the word is sovereign and everything that comes into your life, precious one, is filtered through his sovereign fingers of love. It is designed to make you like Jesus. It was designed to make you Mikhail like Jesus. It was designed so that a story that was told in 1666 speaks to me today and to others that know it about being steadfast and immovable. In John chapter 17, Jesus says in verse 6, he says, I have manifested your name to the men who, you, who gave me, whom you gave me out of the world. You heard Francis Chan, and he spoke on Matthew 28. And he spoke on discipleship, and he spoke on the fact that you and I are to teach these people to observe all things which I have commanded you. How can you teach them to observe all things when you don't know? 
When you don't know what the word of God says, how can you teach them about a God that you have relegated to second or third place because your ministry is above God or your work is above God or your living or your culture or your sports or your children or whatever. He is God and he says, I will have you are to have no other gods before me. And so Jesus says this in John chapter uh, 17. He says, I have manifested your name, who you are, to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. I want to ask you a question. And precious ones, I know I sound hard, but I want to tell you. I'm sorry. I'm 79 years old. I don't plan to retire. There's no retirement in the time of war. But I know that we as a church are ill prepared for the days ahead. And I know the only, the only answer, believe me, the only answer is for you to know God. And if I know that my life has a purpose and every child of God has been chosen by God, you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works that God has before ordained for you to walk in, precious one. But you can't know it, you can't walk it, you can't live it unless the word of God is your life. You've got to make it your priority. And this is what Jesus says. The words that you gave me, I have given to them. Listen, there's so much about discipleship that has so little of the word of God in it. So little of the word of God. It doesn't make the word of God the priority. And the word of God is our priority. Jesus said, you, God, the Father, gave me these words. And these words I am giving to them. He said, the words that I speak in John 5 are the words that God speaks. He doesn't speak any others. He says, I ask you, verse uh, 8, excuse me, for the words you gave me I've given to them, and they received them, and have truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believe that you sent me. I do not ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world. Now this is where you are. But I'm asking because of those that you have given to me. In John chapter 17, Jesus is saying in verse 13 to the Father, now I come to you. All of this is God, Jesus' prayer to the Father. Now I come to you. And these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. It says, Father, sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify means to set apart to make them holy. So what place does God's word have in your life, in your ministry? What place? Thank you, Kay, for that transparent, for that honest, for that challenging appeal for each of us to dig into the Word of God and to make it the very foundation of our lives. Kay Arthur has great resources to help you dig into the Word of God. Just go to precept.org. That's precept.org to learn more. We also want to let you know that this podcast is sponsored by Breakforth Journeys, where we take you to the lands of the Bible to dig into the Word of God on the very sites where the Scriptures came to life. 
You can learn more about our Israel trips, our Israel and Jordan trips, and beyond at BreakForthJourneys.com. We are so grateful for you and for every one of our listeners around the world. We also want to remind you of an incredible treasure available to you for free. Yes, for free. If you'd like access to hundreds of hours of training from some of the top Christian authors, teachers, and thought leaders in the world, just head on over to BreakForthOnline.com. That's BreakForthOnline.com. When you're there, just sign up for a free membership to Break Forth Online, and you'll have access to hundreds of hours of free online training in everything from relationships to spiritual renewal to leadership and far more. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our upcoming live events, as well as our tours to the lands of the Bible for spiritual journeys of a lifetime. Thank you again for listening. Please subscribe, rate this podcast, and come back soon where we will have more words of inspiration waiting for you on Break Forth Fully Alive.